Welcome back, uh, Mama Nasiri. How are you today? I'm excellent. Thank you so much for allowing me to come back again, and thank you. Open invitation. Open invitation. Um, so much to talk about. Uh, we, we, we delved into some things last week. Uh, a lot more to talk about as far as vegans, why it's important to eat right, uh, some things that we can do as far as lifestyle changes, different foods that we need to eat and avoid. Uh, so just a whole plethora of information and uh, just want to get started with you. How did you come about becoming a vegan? Was it overnight? Was it phases? Or did you just wake up and say, I'm tired of all this meat? <laughs> what happened? Well, actually, I didn't have the opportunity to even know the difference between vegetarian and vegan until I had my experience working in San Francisco UC Medical Center as a medical lab tech uh -huh. and um, drawing blood one day and... A phlebotomist? I was a phlebotomist, ex yeah, exactly. And I drew the blood from the patient and she bumped me and the needle stuck me and... I contracted hepatitis B. I was diagnosed. And from that experience, I was confused. I had moved away from home my first year in college and uh, living with roommates. Mm -hmm. And we were eating McDonald's, and um, there was a place called Munchies, 12... Ten for ten for ten cents. Absolutely. Ten burgers. I yes. remember that. And he, they also had one large burger for twelve cents. Uh oh. Did that have cheese? Um, it had cheese. Oh, and the lettuce. It was horrible, but you know, it was good. <laughs> um, and then of course the French fries. You know, um, the sodas. Also, we were going to. Uh, I loved. Um, Mexican food mm -hmm. so I was on Mission Street because I was born and raised in San Francisco so um, you could walk just anywhere and there was always somewhere to eat right mm -hmm. well after that experience um, going to the doctors and taking a numerous blood um, tests um, the doctor noticed um, because I had stomach pain all the time because my liver was swollen mm -hmm. um, he said you're going to need to eat the way your mother raised you and my mother did not work outside of the home um, because my father was a carpenter. Sure. So she provided a, a full, you know, balanced meal every day. And we had salads with our meals because I was the one that um, cut the vegetables. You were the you know. sous chef? I was the chef, yes, yes. And I love to cook. Um, so I communicated with my mother about it and so she started giving me instructions over the phone how to cook the greens and the cornbread and and I what I did I I stopped using all that those ham hocks in my mm -hmm. in my greens and my beans and started using bouillon cubes and mm -hmm. at that time I added garlic and um, uh, bell peppers and celery, you know, to give it the flavor. Mm -hmm. And then I became familiar with the spices because I did come up in a home where my mother also provided spices in our food. Mm -hmm. So I became more creative. And wow. um, yeah, so that's that was my beginning. So just quickly, I'm going to jump back and forth. When you got stuck with the needle? Yes. Did you immediately go get tested or how did you find out that you had contracted? Well, first of all, I was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. So I was a bit, um, didn't take it seriously. It was on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, I was working that morning and I was going to go to a picnic that day. So when I stuck myself, I just gone over to the faucet, ran water over it and covered it up and didn't think about it again. And this was Saturday. Uh, around Wednesday, I was itching, mm. and I didn't know exactly what was going on. I thought maybe it was the soap or just, I, you know, I just didn't imagine. And then it got really intense. So I had gone in to see the doctor, and we were trying to figure out when I told him how my itching mm -hmm. had taken place. Um, I still didn't think about the blood test until my eyes started to turn yellow. And I said, oh, my God, that needle wow. stick. And so I called the doctor and immediately let him know that. And he said, well, we have the lab results. 
He said, you're very ill. Come on in. And mind you, I never stopped going to work Mm -hmm. nor um, uh, going to school. But I would fall asleep after, um, before the class ended because it was one in the afternoon Mm -hmm. because I started work at six. So my body was really exhausted. And I learned when you have these different um, illnesses, it's because your immune system is very low. Mm -hmm. And the doctors at that time, they don't really, even today, they don't tell you exactly the practical way to how to deal with something. But they were a lot more sincere about not giving and administering medication Mm-hmm. The way they, they do, do now. today, right? That's why he said you eat the way your mom, and I felt like there was some kindredship uh, there with doctors, mm-hmm. and this was in 1974. So let me ask you because it's, it's so much we want to cover today, and I'm going to start off um, as far as vegetables and veganism. For those people who, let's just say, who aren't even vegans or vegetarians, that don't like vegetables, but if there were the five most important vegetables that one should be consuming or or the top three, even if you don't care for vegetables at all, that you have to force yourself to eat, what are the top three that are much more um, um, good good for us to, to consume on a regular basis? Well, <clears throat> first of all, Um, We're living in a different time where our environment is different and we're more Mm -hmm. introduced to a lot more fruits and vegetables because Mm -hmm. I shop at the farmer's market every week and sometimes twice a week. Um, Kale has been very, very powerful. I have been confused with the the quality of the uh, the most nutrients in the collard greens and the kale because I grew up eating collard greens. Me too. So I just started including both in my diet, Mm -hmm. raw as well as I cook it in my stew. Because, again, I'm a vegan and I'm making sure that I cover at least five or six different ways to prepare my meals. Right. Um, Also, um, I think dandelion is definitely important. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that last week's show. um, My grandmother, and you know, she's passed a long time ago, but a very wise woman, she used to make dandelion tea. And as a kid, I'm like, what are you doing? You just pick those, <laughs> put in those, you know, so they're very, they're very good for you. It's then. good for your blood. Okay. It cleans the bacteria from your body. Um, it's the bitters, and our body needs bitters, as well as um, the sweets and the salts. You just, we just need to know which ones are the best for us. Mm-hmm. Um, also... Um, the squash is good and eating what's in season mm. you know right now what's in season because I was at the market on Tuesday Brussels sprouts I love Brussels sprouts and for a long time I liked Brussels sprouts but I don't think I knew really how to prepare them and we're going to talk about food preparation in a minute but you know because they're so round and you know thick and hard. It's like, well, how do you really soften these things up? You know, how do you... So Brussels sprouts are good. And and now since we're talking about cooking, um, and by the way, um, you all, she prepared last week for both Brother Keith and I a great vegan meal, um, a vegan stew and the cornbread and the dates. And I can tell you um, before we got home, most of it was already gone. (laughs) <laughs> and and the rest I took to work and uh, brother Keith didn't hardly get to get any of that, but it was it was very well received and it tastes good and I think that that's um, some of the reason why I can speak for myself that I've shied away and wasn't even interested. You know, vegan. It's like well, it doesn't have no taste to it. You know, it's dull. I need jazz my food up. So. Um, it, with that, let's talk about food preparation. What's the best way? to prepare uh, the vegetables so that you can get the most nutrients out of them? Well, <clears throat> as I said, you go to the, the market and you just buy everything in season. Mm-hmm. And since my main meal is the African stew, it's because when I was in college, I connected with the Africans and they made the African stew. 
and uh, I enjoyed it, but we had meat. So I decided to take the meat out 13 years ago. And um, I just um, add all the vegetables, chop them all. And my husband, he's always there. He, he chops so much faster because I'm more worn out. I've been doing this cooking thing for 50 years. Mm-hmm. I bet your chopping so, board is worn out, too. <laughs> several of them. <laughs> and, um, and then I like to, another thing, uh, when my children were growing up, because of my condition of not eating processed foods, and, and they never got an opportunity to go to McDonald's, my 31-year-old son, he said, I only remember McDonald's one time. Well, that's, that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, um, so, and then I just, um, and then stir frying. That's what I did a lot of, stir fry and the spices, of course. So, we're going to talk about the spices because that was one of my questions, too. But stir frying, what type of, um, I want to say oils. Coconut right. oil is the, the most um, practical um oil you can use for most anything Mm -hmm. you know you can fry it fry in it and the the can I get the heat too hot for it as extra virgin olive oil is excellent um, for salads and low heat right right because I I was I had a question about that I like coconut oil but I don't use it as much as I should but my concern was you know how much (coughs) heat can it take so it can withstand quite a bit yes it can Wonderful. You certainly can. So, turmeric. And, well, before I get to that, um, Brother Keith and I, we've been um, following uh, your routine that you and the doctor had shared with us every night to take um, a little bit of turmeric and drink it with some water. Can you tell any difference? Yes. I can That's tell. great. I can tell the difference. Fantastic. Um, because even prior to you sharing um, the good deeds of turmeric, I had heard things here and there about how good it was for the body, um, your eyesight, and just a bunch of uh, things. And it reduces the inflammation, like it, um, you you can press bar it out Mm -hmm. um, um, during bowel movements, Um, you know, it's just many ways. I've noticed um, my complexion. Excellent. It It does clear up the skin. Mm -hmm. So I like that. And then um, I've heard, I can't pronounce it, is it cholera? Um, Cholera? Was it um, coriander? Um, It's a green algae um, cholera. But we can talk about that later. You know what I'm talking about. So what are some of the the favorite spices that you use that are beneficial to the health of, of, of people when you cook? Yes, beside the um, turmeric, uh, cumin was a, uh, is a really fantastic um, herb and spice. Um, I had written down a few of the um, benefits, like it aids your digestion, um, gas, and it's also excellent for folks who are challenged with diabetes. Cum- cumin. Cumin. Uh-huh, C-U-M-I-N. So is that should that be ingested daily or as in, much as you in can? your food? If you can, you can. Sp- what I do, I take all a number of spices, at least anywhere from ten to twenty, and I just put a teaspoon of all of them together, mm-hmm. and then I add a little bit of um, mineral salt to it. That, uh, quickly, because I know it's, salt is not good for us. I Table mean, salt is not right, and and, and I love it. I mineral salt, salt is the, but mineral salt has a lot of um, chemicals in it that's in the book. Mm-hmm. You know, when you get a moment, look at it. And we'll talk it, about that later. Yes, yeah. yes. So what about kosher and sea salt? Th- they are the best. Um, the sea salt, I use the mineral salt um, because I'm used to it and I like the taste. And the body does need salt. We've been confused because of the table salt and all of its processing Um, A lot of people just stop eating salt. But when you stop eating salt, as I remember, my gynecologist told me the body needs everything, but we just need to know what quality, where it's come from. And um, we live in a wonderful time where we can research everything. Right, right. So I'm just going to get right down to it. And um, I know that you share a lot of information that's beneficial for everyone, but I just want to focus on African-American women. What are some of the things that we as African-American women 
are, and again, foods that we should be eating, especially after a certain age, and foods are things that we shouldn't be doing. Lifestyle changes that can help us considerably um, with different um, diseases, um, uterine fibroids, menopause. What what are some changes, lifestyle changes that we need to make that would help us um, in these areas? Uh, this somewhat takes me back to I've learned that um, every seven years, you know, we go through some type of um, change. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it's the body chemistry is changing. And if you really in tune to your body, if you as much as you can, you can decide. Um, I mean, I can only pretty much talk about my experiences because I believe I'm good because I got sick. So I just believe that the ancestors put this in my reality Mm -hmm. to help others. Um, I think most importantly, um, after 25, um, I remember an acupuncturist told me when I had sciatica at age 29, he said the body starts to deteriorate at 25. And I said, oh, wow. okay. And it depends on how much stress, you know. And I was always under a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that it's important to, to reduce the processing of foods. And it's important to learn how to cook a little bit. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so that you won't have to go out and Yes, and you process. know what's in your food. Um, I pretty much um, soups, uh, stews, and all of just put. I sometimes go to the farmers market as I did last time, and I got there late, mm-hmm. so I was able to get everything. So I brought out my huge pot, and I just put all those vegetables in there and let them just cook and do their thing. All, all the spices, and I made seven bowls of them, and I put them in the freezer. Mm-hmm. And you, so I'm never without food. So I start another stew, and I add that in. Um, the the salads, all of what I put in my salads and what I stir fry, I have that all. If it's 20 different vegetables, they're in that salad. Turnips, and then I usually, um, I'm not big on those salad dressings. Right. I prepare my own dressing. So then... Um, Uterine fibroids, Um, you know, um, a lot of us African-American women suffer from them. I don't know why, maybe you do, but what are some of the things that that cause that and what are some of the things that we can do to help um, get rid of those things? Well, um, fortunately, I I think we all come here to have some experience so that we can you know, get on the right track. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I didn't have that challenge because I had to already monitor, monitor my diet. Right. So how many women get that opportunity? True. They're usually 45 or 35. And I won't say it's too late, but you have to get, you know, you kind of have to catch up. Right. But um, staying away from the sugars, um, you know, even this new sugar they call agave nectar, that's not good. It's processed. Mm-hmm. Um, I think maple syrup, you know, little maple syrup, eat your dates and figs. Um, I, I think it's important to um, even exercise, you know, uh, helps. So what about, I read um, a little bit in your book, uh, about things that we women and um, African American women do out of um, vanity, um, different things that we do to our bodies that have a definite impact on some of the ailments that we're dealing with, um, including fibroid, uter- uterine fibroids. Well, one is um, putting perms on our hair, mm-hmm. um, perms and relaxers. All that um, feeds into the, you know, your your scalp, and it goes to the brain, and then it's inflammation in your body. That's, as um, I think Dick Gregory had indicated, we quoted in the book, he had said that there was no such thing as fibro or tumors until we started perming our hair. Mm. And um, and wearing, you know, hair, hair pieces and all of that, um, you know, we don't know where this hair is coming from. That's so true. we, you know, they're now taking them from cadavers and um, they're 
you know, other countries like India, I understand. Sure. You know, they're shipping in thousands of all this hair. And, I mean, I didn't ever we- put any um, weaves in my hair, but I did wear wigs back a few times back in the 70s, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because that was just important and we were ignorant and we didn't know. But now it's such a big deal because as African Americans, we are, we work in an environment that where people don't predominantly look like us. Right. So we're trying to fit in. So therefore, we don't feel good if we go in with a, you know, a hair too curly. And we, we have beautiful hair, but we don't know this. Right. Um, but at the same time, we, we press it and we process it. And by the time you're 40, you know, you don't have any hair. <laughs> and that's the reality that you really want your hair at 40, right, 50. Right. So I'm, I'm really fortunate my hair would break when I permed. So therefore, I couldn't ever leave a perm very long. Right. So I, I'm grateful because, you know, I, I do have some hair that I can work with. Beautiful hair. Beautiful hair. Thank you. Uh, and it only makes sense, too, because um, hair being directly connected to the scalp, which is mm-hmm. very close to the brain. Absolutely. So I would see how those chemicals or... Uh, or, or the scalp not being able to breathe with all the coverings and, and that yes. sort of thing. And right. we need the sunlight because as um, African people, you know, our ancestry, you know, is the sun. You know, I believe it was sun before there was all this cold or whatever. Right. So some of us more than others, it really doesn't have anything to do with, the, you know, your skin color. It's, it's your, you know, your organs, you know, your DNA, Um you know, we, we're different, and we have to learn this about ourselves. Who who am I? Mm-hmm. I belong more in the sun. Right. And, and I know my blood type, A positive, I learned 13 years ago that I was born to be a vegan. I mean, oh, with I mean. blood type? Blood type. And it's interesting. <laughs> wow, that is interesting. That's probably and another I, show. That was, yeah. And, and now you, they don't want to give you a lot of information about blood type. You go around asking people what their blood type, they're oblivious. They don't have a clue. Well, even um, a friend of mine had shared with me that she w- went to a, a doctor's visit, and I guess she didn't know her blood type. And she asked the doctor, well, what's my blood type? And he couldn't, he wouldn't tell her. He says that you have to go somewhere or go online, or, and it's just like, well, you got my file right there. So I don't know what the big secret is, but I'm glad that you brought that up. It's frightening because I had uh, asked about my blood type 20 years ago when I moved from Alaska because I lived there for five years, raised three sons there, and I came back to the Bay Area, and I had gone to the doctor because I had some throat infection or something, and and he wanted to take a blood test. So I asked, I said, could you please take a a blood type, Mm -hmm. uh, a a blood test, a a blood bank? test. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, you don't need that. I said, well, I understand if you know your blood type, you can dis- determine your diet. He said, that's nonsense. So I was quiet. So that experience um, passed. Well, I had another doctor six years ago I had gone to, and he wanted to take a blood test, which was my last blood test. And I asked him to take a blood, you know, for my blood type Mm -hmm. and he said oh no um, we don't need that Um, we're not doing it so the reason that I know about my A positive I remember when I had my children and I wasn't sure so I gone back to UC Medical Center where I had two of the children Mm -hmm. of the three and I had to pay $25 and they gave it to me so it was A positive Um, Mm -hmm. This is so much good, good information. And listeners, I hope that you're all taking heed. I certainly am. And in closing, tell us, to wrap it up, what are some of the things that we should be avoiding these days to stay healthy and some of the things that we should be doing more of to stay healthy, meaning, you know, eating habits and that sort of thing? Yes, we should avoid... um, the, the white sugars, the white salt, the white flour, um, any ingredients on the label you're not familiar with, hmm. you're not sure if it's a sugar or a salt, 
mm-hmm. you know, be cautious of that. Right. Um, I think, you know, your juicing is good, you know, juicing. I do smoothies every day. And she brought me one today. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, and the smoothie... Um, I even use, for my joints and bones, I use Irish moss. I use a lot of seaweed, and that's from the, you know, the sea. It's mm-hmm. I like seaweed. Yeah, it's really good. Um, and, um, yeah, those are the things. And is there, uh, oh, reasonable exercise is important. Mm-hmm. You know, meditation. Um, we We need to not be so involved in, um, trying to make all this, you know, money and, you know, mm-hmm. like for instance, I, I retired at the age of 59 and they told me I would get double that if I stayed until I was 62. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it was so intense and the money got to be interesting and so they gave me a package. I accepted it and now we have three books that we've written. And so tell us where um, we can purchase those books. Um, you can purchase them. Um, at Rainbow Groceries here in San Francisco, mm-hmm. um, Marcus Bookstore in Oakland, and now we have it in Food Mills. Okay. Um, yeah, and then you can also go to the website at spicytastyvegan.com, the email spicytastyvegan at gmail.com, and we also have a Facebook present. Um, and that's um, facebook.com slash spicy tasty vegan the books and we have an office number which is 510-473-6579 all right can you repeat that one more time yes um, the office number is 510-473-6579 the website is spicy tasty vegan.com Email spicy tasty vegan at gmail dot com, Facebook dot com slash spicy tasty vegan the books. Wonderful. So, and also um, Black History Month next month we have two uh, presents um, at the San Francisco Public Library, Bayview. Uh, branch as well as the Western Edition. And the 20th on Western Edition and February 6th at the Bayview. All right, that's wonderful. So there you go, uh, another edition of Give Life, Save Life Radio. Want to thank both Valerie Bakaj for joining us with PWI and of course uh, Mother Nasirai. And um, All good information, women in power, women entrepreneurship, giving back to the communities in in different ways, but all the same giving back, and we appreciate everything that you ladies are doing and have done. And we're looking forward to you coming back on the show. And with that, have a great day, all of our Give Life, Save Life listeners and ambassadors. Things you do and say. Watch the 